Welcome to my presentation by the rule of that philosophy, validating the Oxfordian thesis using theories of knowledge, justification, and truth. My name is Michael Dudley, and I'm an academic librarian at the University of Winnipeg in Manitoba, Canada. My talk is based on my book, The Shakespeare Authorship Question and Philosophy, Knowledge, Rhetoric, Identity, coming out in December this year from Cambridge Scholars Publishing. The purpose of my presentation is to compare and contrast the two authorial models represented by Shakespeare as Shakespeare, SAS, and Oxford as Shakespeare, OAS, according to external criteria in the form of theories of knowledge and truth, not to demonstrate which model is true, but which is the more truth conducive. This quote from Thomas Aquinas perfectly captures my intent in this book. He wrote, Behold our refutation of the error. It is not based on documents of faith, but on the reasons and statements of the philosophers themselves. My book is divided into three parts, knowledge, rhetoric, identity. This presentation is going to focus just on chapters four and five dealing with theories of knowledge and truth, although I am going to be using some of the material from chapter two to do a theoretical framing for this analysis. As some of you may be aware, uh, some of the content of this book, about half, has been previously published in Brief Chronicles and the Oxfordian and the De Vere Society newsletter and elsewhere, but about half of the content of the book is new and existing articles have been expanded in some cases considerably. Before I get into talking about theories of knowledge and truth, I first need to theorize the authorship debate by establishing the nature of first and second realities. German-American philosopher Eric Vogelin was critical of modern individualism and idealism and utopianism, especially on the part of Georg Hegel and Karl Marx, because he said that idealism and utopianism can result in envisioned what he called second realities that conflict with first reality, i.e. the reality that all of us share. And this can cause friction with that mind independent reality. But more than that, he said that that can cause a disturbance within reality, that there's there are going to be real world effects and what he called the eclipse of reality. Now, in this context, we can probably think of no greater eclipse of reality than that of the author William Shakespeare, whomever he was, by the businessman William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon, which the uh, Reverend William H. Furness said the two could not be brought within planetary distance of each other. They are, in fact, opposites. When philosophers are confronted with opposites, they generally think in terms of dialectical relationships. The dialectic is generally conceived of that we have a thesis and then its opposite, its antithesis, equaling a synthesis of the two. This is often uh, mistakenly attributed to Hegel, but in fact Hegel's dialectic is far more subtle and powerful and I believe essential to understanding the nature of the Shakespeare authorship question. What he conceived of is that we begin with an abstract, he proposed being, and then it's opposite, nothing. The two are then brought together in a process of what he called Aufheben, which in English translates to sublation, which means to abolish, but also to lift up. So the meanings of being, the meanings of nothing, are abolished, they are lifted up and become something new. We have a trinity and this new element becoming the, uh, the meanings of the, the first two, the abstract and the opposite, are, are no longer what they once were. Now, you may ask, what does this have to do with Shakespeare? I believe that for centuries we have been living with the result of what I'm calling the Stratfordian dialectic. Our abstract is the author, William Shakespeare, and the opposite is the historic individual, William Shakespeare. Through the process of Aufhaven, these are abolished and lifted up to become the new element of the Trinity, William Shakespeare, the Bard of Avon. The meanings 
of the author, the meaning of the historic individual are now abolished. They are no longer what they once were. And this is what makes it so difficult to debate Stratfordians because we are not referring, the words that we are using are not the, the words that they are using. The meanings are different. Um, so uh, Eric Vogelin uh, referred to this process as alchemy. Uh, he called Hegel a wizard or a sorcerer uh, because of, of the power of, of Aufhaven. And he said that what results is a second reality. What Vogelin said about Hegel's second realities is that that second reality has to look as if it is an operation in first reality, but it also has to escape control and judgment by the criteria of first reality. And I think this is an excellent description of what we have with the endless biographiction of Stratfordian biographies. They exist in a second reality that seeks to escape control and judgment by the criteria of first reality. So my objective with this book is to hold the Shakespeare as Shakespeare model to the control and judgment of the criteria of first reality in the form of theories of knowledge, justification, and truth. So what are we comparing and contrasting here? Our two authorial propositions or models, there's nothing unique about how I'm putting this, but Shakespeare as Shakespeare says that William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon wrote the plays and poems of Shakespeare openly and was publicly known at the time as their author. Oxford as Shakespeare holds that Edward de Vere wrote the plays and poems of Shakespeare secretly, employing a pseudonym, and was only known at the time as their author by court insiders. Obviously, these different propositions are going to present themselves differently in the kind of evidence that we should expect. What do we mean by our first reality criteria to evaluate these models? Well, theories of knowledge. How do we know what we think we know, especially about the past? Theories of justification. On what basis are we claiming to know what we think we know? And theories of truth. To what extent do our knowledge claims comport with conditions that obtain in the actual world? So, Let's start with theories of knowledge and justification. What do we mean by knowledge? In epistemology, we are, understand knowledge as justified true belief, or JTB, where S, a knowing subject, knows that P, a proposition, is true at T, a given time, if and only if the proposition is true, the subject believes that proposition, and the subject is justified at a given time in believing that proposition. But, epistemologists ask, is it possible to have justified true belief without knowledge? In 1963, Edmund Gettier proposed that yes, it is possible. He proposed a thought experiment of two men, Smith and Jones, who are at an interview for the same job. Smith has learned that the boss intends to hire Jones. He also knows, somehow, that Jones has 10 coins in his pocket. So Smith has the belief that the successful candidate will have 10 coins in his pocket. In the end, however, it is Smith who is hired, and unbeknownst to Smith, he himself had 10 coins in his pocket. So his justified true belief about the man being hired have ten, having 10 coins in his pocket did not result in actual knowledge of the conditions that would obtain. Now, you may ask again, what does this have to do with Shakespeare? I propose that there are Gettier cases in the authorship question in which Stratfordians and Oxfordians both hold a justified true belief, but only one of these groups can be said to have actual knowledge of Shakespeare. Our first case, the Swan of Avon, both Stratfordians and Oxfordians have a justified true belief that the author Shakespeare is associated with a geographic location known as Avon. For Stratfordians, this can only mean the river Avon that flows through the town of Stratford-upon-Avon. But for Oxfordians, they know that William Camden referred to Hampton Court in his 1610 Britannia 
as Avon, having been known as this historically, thanks to Alexander Waugh's discovery of this in 2014. And this, for Oxfordians, makes much more sense of Ben Jonson's passage about the waters, which would refer to the River Thames and not to the River Avon. Now, nothing would prevent Stratfordians from also acknowledging, oh, this is a reference to performances at Hampton Court. But if they did, this would then surrender the one anchor that they have to the town of Stratford. Our second Gettier case is that both Stratfordians and Oxfordians have a justified true belief that the author Shakespeare had a personal relationship of some kind with Henry Risley, the third Earl of Southampton. Both can point to their justification to the deeply personal and indeed intimate dedication to the Earl in the poems uh, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. And there's also a widely shared belief that the uh, Earl of Southampton was the fair youth to whom so many of the sonnets were addressed. However, Oxfordians know that Southampton was also engaged for a time to Oxford's daughter Elizabeth de Vere at the urging of William Cecil. Unfortunately for Stratfordians, after centuries of searching, no documentary evidence of any kind has ever been found linking Southampton to William Shakespeare of Stratford-upon-Avon. So again, justified true belief does not always uh, result in actual knowledge. Only one group can claim to have actual knowledge of Shakespeare. Our third case is that both Stratfordians and Oxfordians believe that Shakespeare, the author, had a relationship with Ben Jonson. They share their justification based on a passage regarding Shakespeare in Jonson's 1641 posthumously published book, Timber, where he wrote, I love the man and do honor his memory on this side of idolatry as much as any. However, Oxfordians know that Jonson shares a family connection with Edward de Vere. He was, in the words of Ruth Lloyd Miller, particularly close to Oxford's youngest daughter, Susan and the Herbert brothers, William Herbert, 3rd Earl of Pembroke, who at one point had been engaged to Bridget de Vere, Oxford's second daughter, and Philip Herbert, the 4th Earl of Montgomery, who was married to Susan. Again, only one group can be said to have actual knowledge of Shakespeare. So if justified true belief doesn't always equal knowledge, what do we mean by knowledge? I want to focus on the causal theory of knowledge proposed by Alvin Goldman in 1967 which requires an unbroken chain of justified true beliefs between an event and the knower. However, there must be no breaks or mistakes in the chain, so that a subject can be said to know a proposition only if it's causally connected in an appropriate way. And to explain this, he proposed a thought experiment about a volcano that erupts, but in the years following, someone comes and clears away all the volcanic rock and then years after that, someone with no knowledge of that original eruption comes and puts a whole bunch of volcanic rocks around to make it look like there had been an eruption. So that someone coming along a hundred years later might infer reasonably that there had been an eruption, but they can't be said to have actually had their knowledge be causally connected in an appropriate way with that original eruption because there was no unbroken chain. In this light, are the assertions regarding Shakespeare's writing career causally connected in an appropriate way with our believing in that proposition? Nearly 230 years would elapse between the death of Shakespeare and Charles Knight's first book-length and fanciful 1843 biography of Shakespeare. So we cannot say that there was an unbroken, unmistaken connection between the events, the supposed events of Shakespeare's literary life and our knowledge of it. The causal case for Oxford's writing career is quite different. There are multiple contemporary accounts of Oxford's writing career from his lifetime, including the 1589 reference in the Art of English Poesy, which praised Oxford for comedy and interlude, and Francis Mears' Pallidus Timia, where Oxford is described as the best for comedy among us. So what about theories of justification? Evidentialism is a theory about having or possessing the evidence 
so that your belief in the evidence is what counts rather than actually possessing physically the evidence, which would be the case uh, in, in matters of law. But here, Oxfordians possess the evidence of Oxford's 1,000 pound annuity, while Stratfordians possess the evidence of the Holy Trinity Monument. These are examples. So such evidence then supports your doxastic attitude, or rather your belief, your disbelief, or your decision to withhold belief. So your doxastic attitude towards the proposition has to be epistemically justified in terms of fitting the evidence for that proposition. So if we look at our authorial propositions, is the Oxfordian belief in Oxford as Shakespeare epistemically justified based on the evidence that we possess, or is it based on motivated reasoning? Is the Stratfordian belief in Shakespeare as Shakespeare epistemically justified based on the evidence that they possess, or is it based on motivated reasoning? Well, I think that we can fairly confidently say that the Oxfordian theory is based on evidence that we possess. The Stratfordian assertions about Shakespeare being the author are pretty much entirely based on motivated reasoning. Similarly is the Stratfordian disbelief in Oxford as Shakespeare epistemically justified. Is the Oxfordian disbelief in Shakespeare as Shakespeare epistemically justified? So we can, we can say confidently that the Stratfordian disbelief in Oxford isn't epistemically justified. They haven't given it a fair uh, evaluation. It is dismissed out of hand. And this is for non-epistemological reasons, i.e. motivated reasoning. Whereas the Oxfordian disbelief in the Shakespeare as Shakespeare model is epistemically justified based on the evidence. The other theory of justification is reliabilism. Now this doesn't look at your evidence, but rather your individual and group knowledge formation processes. So it emphasizes your aptness as a knower, and it's premised on epistemic virtues such as being open-minded and inquisitive and having intellectual humility and not being dogmatic and sticking with a, a belief even in the face of evidence. So if your belief in a proposition at a given time is the product of a reliable cognitive belief forming process or set of processes, then your belief can be said to be justified. And this also works for groups as well. So group reliabilism is based on the extent to which they have evidence-based competencies. So evidence gathering, assessing the evidence, filtering it, disclosing it, sharing the assessment of the evidence, and being aware of non-epistemic influences so that you're not cherry-picking your evidence, and also being open about scrutinizing counter-evidence. So in light of these conditions, these criteria, can we say that Stratfordians are good scientists? Uh, I think we can confidently say no, because of course their evidence is very selective uh, in favor of their theory and they do not examine counter evidence. So let's take a quick look here at our theories of knowledge and justification. The causal theory of knowledge, the Shakespeare is Shakespeare model? No, it does not apply. For Oxford, it does. Is there justified true belief that actually results in knowledge? For Shakespeare as Shakespeare? No, but for Oxford as Shakespeare? Yes, because there are Gettier cases in the Stratfordian case where their justified true belief does not result in knowledge. But for the Oxford as Shakespeare model, there are no Gettier cases. We can also say that the Shakespeare Shakespeare model cannot be said to be justified evidentially or in terms of reliabilism, whereas for the Oxford as Shakespeare model in both cases, it's yes. Well, what about our second set of first reality criteria in terms of theories of truth? There are three major theories of truth, the correspondence theory of truth, the coherence theory of truth, and the pragmatic theory of truth. Let's look first at correspondence. With correspondence, we are seeking to establish 
proposition world relations. In other words, to demonstrate that any given proposi proposition must be found to correlate with facts or states of affairs in the world. So for example, if the phrase snow is white is true, it is because snow is actually white. Now the challenge is, with history, how do we apply the correspondence theory of truth to historical documents? Well, some historians believe that historiography is not a study of the past as such, but of the present effects, the traces and remains of the past. So the study of documents and, um, and physical remains such as um, memorials and buildings and ruins and so on. And so with historical realism, we are then again seeking that causal chain that leads from the events of history through historiography and through the evidence. And so in this case, applying the correspondence theory of truth to the authorial models, we're going to be asking what are the present real world phenomena that obtain for each case, okay? So for Shakespeare as Shakespeare, we should see extant evidence that Shakespeare's authorship would have been noted and discussed publicly. But this is not at all what we find in the present phenomena. The contemporary historical record is quite silent on Shakespeare's alleged writing career. What about applying the correspondence theory to the Oxford model? Well, given the, the model that it's about uh, a nobleman writing in secret, we should see that any reference would be highly circumspect or indeed cryptic. And this is exactly what the record demonstrates. And, and uh, Alexander Waugh has done an excellent job of uncovering many of these very cryptic references, revealing that many of the contemporaries of Oxford knew that he was Shakespeare. What about the coherence theory of truth? Coherence is all about the extent to which the claims stick together. They hold together to create a very compelling portrait that indicates that that belief is true. But if we look at the Shakespeare as Shakespeare model, it has no consistency. It's full of contradictions. It has no coherence because its claims do not create a single set of assertions. And it is not comprehensive because it cannot begin to explain how Shakespeare became Shakespeare, and it is replete with incongruities, such as the hypothetical dating schemes. But if we apply the coherence theory to the Oxford model, we see that it is consistent and coherent and comprehensive and congruent, which argues strongly for its truth indicativeness. And this is excellently exemplified by Hank Whittemore and his book, 100 Reasons Shakespeare Was the Earl of Oxford. And now for our final theory of truth, pragmatism. With pragmatism, we are looking at a theory that was developed in the late 19th century by Charles Sanders Peirce and William James that evaluates theories in terms of their pro practical consequences in the world. Pragmatists ask, what difference does it make whether one notion or theory uh, is true or not? Now, this should resonate because people are always asking, well, what does it matter? What difference does it make who Shakespeare was? Well, this is exactly what pragmatism is concerned with. It's characterized by productive and resilient knowledge practices that have a demonstrable ability to answer objections and deal frankly with alternative perspectives. Interestingly, though, the pragmatic theory issues metaphysical claims. It's not so much concerned with what actually exists out there. Instead, its interests are methodological, not substantive. It links truth to our epistemic practices and says the truth is best understood as those beliefs which have withstood long-term open inquiry and examination and promise to do so into the future. The pragmatic theory emphasizes epistemic success, being able to validate and assimilate truthful propositions in such a way as to make a tangible, valuable difference in one's understanding. As William James said, what in short is the truth's cash value 
in experiential terms? Well, this is something that I explored in my analysis of the How I Became an Oxfordian essays, which was originally published in the Dever Society newsletter, and I uh, made into this SOF video, The Bard Identity Becoming an Oxfordian, and is now chapter 10 of my book. And the analysis of the How I Became an Oxfordian essay demonstrates incontrovertibly the cash value that belief in Oxford has in terms of its explanatory power and being able to connect people to a real author. Um, so there's a great deal in experiential terms. So now let's summarize the theories of truth. Neither the correspondence, coherence, or pragmatic theory of truth can be said to apply to the Shakespeare as Shakespeare model. The Oxford as Shakespeare model can be said to correspond with all three of these theories. So in conclusion, using these and other theories that I explore in my book, I think we can escape the Stratfordian second reality. Let's take a quick look then and compare the models. Theory of knowledge, none applicable to the Shakespeare as Shakespeare model, the OAS model, we can say, can say uh, we can use the causal theory of knowledge. No theory of justification applies to SAS. Evidentialism and reliabilism can be said to apply to OAS. No theory of truth applies to the SAS model, whereas correspondence, coher coherence, and pragmatism apply to OAS. Is the Shakespeare as Shakespeare model testable? No. It, it isn't, because it's based on magical thinking. The OAS model is testable. The SAS model is also not falsifiable, because you can't falsify imagination and genius. Whereas, theoretically, the Oxford as Shakespeare model could be falsified. We could prove that Oxford wasn't the author. So the SAS model is not capable of answering objections beyond being able to refer to the magic of genius, etc., whereas the OAS model is. It is resilient. It can answer objections. The SAS model is not consistent with epistemic norms, but Oxford is. And finally, the SAS model has no explanatory potential, or very little. If you read a biography, it simply goes from the childhood and youth, and suddenly he writes Venus and Adonis. There's no way to explain how that happened whereas the OAS model does have a great deal of explanatory potential. This analysis shows that what I'm calling the Stratfordian dialectic has created a second reality in which Stratfordian biography and scholarship operate, and which seeks to escape judgment by external criteria, resulting in friction with reality and a disturbance within reality. I believe, then, that the authorship debate is not really between two authorial claims at all, but between two completely different worldviews concerning belief, knowledge, human nature, and the nature of reality itself. The Shakespeare as Shakespeare model is simply inconsistent with epistemic norms, and so is objectively not truth conducive. The Oxford as Shakespeare model is consistent with epistemic norms, and is therefore objectively truth conducive. What does this mean going forward? I believe the Oxfordian movement should reconsider the desirability and utility of traditional authorship debates. We are just simply not operating on the same reality, uh, and instead adopt and promote its model in terms of the pragmatic theory of truth, rather than in terms of a metaphysical truth claim. In other words, we can show how effective and resilient our knowledge practices are. And instead, we should challenge Stratfordians on their ability to meet basic epistemic norms and other external criteria, rather than on the basis of their metaphysical truth claims. And finally, I believe that the Oxfordian movement should promote the authorship question and the Oxfordian thesis to and within interdisciplinary scholarly associations and societies devoted to open inquiry on the grounds of academic freedom and epistemology. Such organizations would include the Academic Freedom Alliance, the Heterodox Academy, and in Canada, the Society for Academic Freedom and Scholarship. Thank you very much.